It's a lonely task, this podcast, speaking ideas into the void like a message launched into space on the off chance that some intelligent being will pick up the transmission. I've been experiencing a heightened level of anxiety in recent months. I think I'm afraid of what's coming next, of not knowing where I will land or quite how to get there. I've learned from long experience that there is no utility in arguing against these states of mind, these unspoken and illiterate moods. I have to interpret them to the best of my ability and try to align myself with their needs. What is this edginess about? What am I supposed to be doing? Am I guilty of procrastination, weakness of character, or maybe an over-optimistic allegiance to continuing down the wrong path? The beatings will continue until morale improves. I guess that's what they are there for. More precisely, morale will improve when I no longer deserve the beating. I have characterized the human condition as a kind of enslavement to the coercion of neurochemistry. The conscious mind is a physical system subject to physical manipulation. The proximate physics consists in the dynamics of neural tissues under the mechanistic influences of these chemicals. Obviously, the neural structures have been sculpted by natural selection, not for our mental well-being, but to favor the continuation of genes. The operations of dopaminergic, opioid, and serotonergic systems have been tinkered into their current configuration based entirely on the pragmatics of human success. Those genes which persist and proliferate are whichever fit best to the world. In in an important sense, we are fortunate to live in a universe in which relentless suffering isn't the favored condition. Likely, the human brain's advanced cognitive abilities entail a trade-off, that lends adaptive flexibility at the cost of new avenues of suffering when compared to animals that live simpler lives. For example, a sea anemone or a coral has few, if any, decisions to make. Like a plant, these creatures are probably not possessed of any mind at all. By contrast, we assume mammals and birds to be quite conscious because they have similar brain structures to ours and they behave in sophisticated ways. That's not evidence of consciousness, of course, but it's worth thinking about what might count as evidence if we could just imagine the right experiments. Intelligence is too often confused with consciousness, and this is a mistake. Learning algorithms run on modern computers are plenty intelligent in that they could be used to demonstrate a high IQ. What else might we expect to find in conscious animals which would help decide the issue? The experience of pain is a conscious event which often reflects damage to tissue. Pain serves as a behavioral motivator for conscious creatures. If you burn your hand on a hot stove, a spinal reflex will cause your hand to rapidly move away from the hot surface. Only afterwards, perhaps even a second or more afterward, will you experience searing pain. If you have any sense, you will place your injured hand under a cold tap or otherwise tend to it. In addition, you will have learned a valuable lesson which will adjust future behavior. A standard robot could be equipped with sensors superficially similar to the pain receptors found in human skin. These detectors could adjust behavioral algorithms to avoid touching the hot stove again, too. But under the direction of behavioral algorithms, the robot need not and will not suffer pain. What would the pain be for? And how would the circuitry produce it? In the human case, and presumably in the case of other animals, pain is apparently a useful adaptation to dangerous potentialities. Where there is suffering associated with danger and injury, it's a good bet that the animal's will makes a difference to its behavior. That's a conscious mind which serves a function. So if we can establish that an animal acts as if it experiences pain, that might be evidence for its consciousness. But how do we extinguish between the adaptive behavior mediated by pain and the adaptive behavior mediated by a non-conscious algorithm? I came across an idea in the book Metazoa by Peter Godfrey Smith. It concerns insects. I don't think insects are conscious, by the way, though I could be dead wrong about that. The author says, quote, Many insects are impressive on the sensory side of things. They have good vision and can fly. Flight is a behavior featuring especially complex feedback between action and the senses, the sort of feedback that contributes to a point of view. Let's now turn to another aspect of experience, pain, pleasure, and feelings of that kind. Though philosophers obsess about vision, Pain and pleasure are probably what come to mind when people not steeping in recent philosophy think about basic forms of experience in animals. How do insects look on this side? 
The picture is very different. Some decades ago, Craig Eisenman and a group of colleagues at the University of Queensland in Australia argued that insects do not feel pain, as all known insects appear completely unconcerned about damage to the bodies, even the most severe kinds. Wound tending has never been seen in an insect. After injury, these animals just continue as best they can with whatever they have to do. They may show some initial squirming, but then they get back to work. Unquote. A bit later, he writes, quote, No susception is the detection of damage tied to a behavioral response. It is very common in animals, but can lend itself to an interpretation as mere reflex. As a result, people look for markers of something more, markers of something might, that might be tied to feeling. The options include, one, tending and protecting injuries. Two, seeking out analgesic chemicals. Three, learning to avoid particular behaviors or situations. And four, trade-offs in choice situations where an animal seems to balance the badness of an experience with other costs and benefits. These are all seen as behavioral tests for the presence of felt pain or something like it. When we look again at insects, with tests like this in mind, we find that one test the insects do pass is the one involving learning. In particular, some insects can learn to avoid situations where they will be exposed to excessive heat. But insects have still never been observed tending injuries. That claim from the old no-pain paper still holds up. Crustaceans, as we saw earlier, do things like this, and so do octopuses. Julia Groening and her colleagues decided to see whether bees who had been slightly injured would seek out analgesic drugs. Tests of this kind have been applied to chickens and other animals and be, can be quite convincing evidence for pain. It is then worth asking whether bees, who are very smart animals, will seek out morphine when they are injured with a pinching clamp or the amputation of a limb. Groening and her colleagues found that they do not. Reading between the lines, I think Groening and her team were a little surprised at this result. Unquote. Godfrey Smith favors consciousness of some kind in all manner of animals, even the simplest invertebrate forms. But studies such as this are a clever counterpoint. I looked up the original paper by Groening et al. It was published in 2017, called In Search of Evidence for the Experience of Pain in Honeybees, a Self-Administration Study. And it looks to me to be pretty solid research. Groening et al. write, quote, The honeybee is a promising model organism for the investigation of potential pain due to its impressive learning abilities and cognitive capacities, which are in many respects comparable to those of vertebrates. Honeybee foragers can learn complex associations between odors and appetitive, as well as aversive stimuli, will stop other bees from dancing if they are advertising a dangerous food source, and can even exhibit negative emotional states. Moreover, self-medication as well as altruistic self-removal of sick foragers have been reported, suggesting a certain level of self-awareness, if not consciousness, at least in its most basic form. It is difficult to demonstrate that an animal experiences pain and not just nociception. In fact, some authors argue that it is impossible to prove or disprove pain experience in any species, and we may only be able to draw conclusions about the relative likelihood that an animal experiences pain-like states. Pain is a negative emotional state or feeling that cannot be measured directly. Animals cannot tell us what they feel, hence we rely largely on behavioral responses, often combined with physiological and cognitive measures, to infer emotional states and assess the capacity to suffer in other species. Several authors have proposed a list of criteria that needs to be fulfilled to demonstrate pain experience in animals. One of them is the responsiveness to opioids, analgesics, and local anesthetics. In mammals, the release of endogenous opioids reduces the occurrence of indicators of pain, and so does the injection of the opiate morphine. This effect can be reversed by naloxone, an opiate antagonist. Thus, the presence of opiate receptors in response to analgesics in presumably painful conditions can be a useful indicator of pain experience in animals. It has been demonstrated in praying mantis, crickets, and honeybees that morphine injection reduces their defensive response to a noxious stimulus in a dose-dependent way and that this analgesic effect can be blocked by naloxone. These studies suggest that insects have opiate binding sites or opioid general sensitivity similar to vertebrates or, alternatively, non-opioid receptors, receptors to which morphine binds. In honeybees, morphine suppresses the stinging response to electric shock, and it has been suggested that their alarm pheromone produces stress-induced analgesia. In addition to analysis of the neurochemical and physiological responses to putatively painful stimuli, behavioral studies provide important insights into a potential experience of pain in animals. 
A particularly convincing experimental approach is the self-administration of an analgesic drug. Self-selection models are well established. For instance, Colbert et al. used a simple choice procedure and found that rats suffering from arthritis would self-administer an anti-inflammatory analgesic, or the opiate fentanyl, while sound rats preferred to drink sugar solution. This finding is consistent with the hypothesis that arthritis is painful for rats. Similarly, Danbury et al. showed that lame broiler chickens selectively chose food that contained carprofen as an analgesic, suggesting that they were in pain. The wounded birds consumed more drug food than sound birds, and the consumption of the analgesic increased with the severity of the injury." Unquote. Given this background, we can assume that insects must have opiate receptors and nociceptive signaling which comes from the limbs. Otherwise, the morphine study would have made no sense to do. Groening et al. induced injuries to the honeybees and then allowed them to eat freely from two different sucrose solutions, one with morphine and the other without. It turned out that the injured bees took no more from the morphine solution than the uninjured controls. Insects appear to behave just like intelligent robots, altogether lacking consciousness. We would expect the robot to learn to avoid situations which cause damage, but to take no interest in analgesia, as there is no pain to try to reduce. Morphine does not help fix an injury. It serves no such function. It takes away the suffering. So a wise algorithm would have no interest in directing behavior toward morphine. The same logic applies to us. The addicts slumped over on sidewalks in cities across America are not behaving according to algorithms, and they aren't behaving in favor of their genes. They are effectively sabotaging the interest of their genes in favor of taking away the pain. They are conscious creatures, and as I have warned before, consciousness is a dangerous long-term evolutionary strategy. Poke a conscious human being with a pointy stick too hard and too often, and they might volunteer to end their own genetic line, along with the suffering you have caused. Given that the suffering is solely a product of the brain, it would be helpful in such situations to be able to willfully suppress the pain so that it couldn't be used against our interests. Unfortunately, we would abuse such willful control, applying it to everyday aches and pains as we do with aspirin and Tylenol. Given the choice, we would suffer no pains. I'm in the habit of taking a daily jog. It can be hard work, especially on hot days, and I'd probably run myself into the grave if I could take away the hardship. Godfrey Smith talks about emotion-like states as evidence that bugs can be conscious after all, but I'm not convinced by it. As far as I can see, these are just different conditional modes of behavior. If such and such, then switch to mode such and such. That's perfectly likely to be developed in a naturally selected, non-conscious organism. On the other hand, rodents subjected to the kind of tests suggested above give all indication of suffering pain in the true sense. When we situate laboratory rats in an artificial environment, they seem to be able to access their share of misery and mental illness. Consider, for example, my own work on a model of PTSD in rats. We subject rats to a series of extreme stressors in a method called single prolonged stress. These animals reliably show behavioral abnormalities and other hallmarks of post-traumatic stress, which persist for a long time afterward. But what about what I'm about to tell you is really important. In order for the animals to show these deficits, they must be single housed for a whole week after the presentation of the stressors. These are social animals. If they are housed in pairs, they do not reliably show the behavioral deficits after stress. I've also read that rodents do not tend to become addicted to substances like cocaine and heroin if they're housed in natural colonies. They might dabble with the drugs from time to time if given the chance, but it takes social isolation to really make junkies out of them, and then they will choose drugs over food to the point of death. Interrogating the memory system of a robot to get information is a lot easier than a human brain in one sense, and a lot harder in another sense. On the one hand, the data must be represented by some kind of logic in the robot. It's hackable in the way the computers are vulnerable. Someone who understands how the machine was made and how it stores information can get you a long way toward extracting the data you're looking for. With the human brain, this is a nearly impossible task. We are not even close to being able to do so with current knowledge and technology. On the other hand, there are ways of convincing a conscious human being to give you what you want. At your disposal is the application of torture. There isn't even a need to produce long-lasting physical damage to do so. Simply stimulating pain pathways in the brain will do the trick if you know your way around the thing. Suppose a robot is explicitly programmed not to give up a piece of information. 
There may be technical ways to get it, but they will not involve coercion by pain. You can take the robot apart piece by piece if you want. There is no convincing it to give up the goods. The key to getting a human subject to violate their values is to find a lever to something which, like it or not, they value more. There are many things we value or believe ourselves to value, but few are more valued than stopping our own terrible suffering. There are many things which we value high enough to die protecting, but sometimes death is not an option. And there are certainly worse things that can happen to us than dying. The third or fourth time your torturer dunks your head under the water for an extended period of time, you are likely to value not having it happen again quite highly. And having this treatment continue for the rest of the day is a lot worse than having it end here and now, dead or alive in the aftermath. I suggested the idea of self-administered analgesia as an indication of functional consciousness in an animal. Even wounded chickens will partake in this, and of course rodents will. In the laboratory, isolation of research animals from their kind begets pathological levels of drug taking. Wounded insects, however, despite being smart enough, do not self-administer morphine. This strongly suggests that they do not experience pain, and by extension, it leans me toward the position that they are not conscious. In any case, what does it say about the current human condition that nearly 108,000 Americans died by drug overdose last year? The year before, it was almost 94,000. In 2019, it was something like 70,000. Every year, more and more of our people, a lot more. In the laboratory, we have, we have to isolate social animals in order to get them to such a state. Are we becoming more isolated, resentful of one another, guilty, and depressed? Could it be getting this much worse this fast? We are running off a cliff like lemmings. No, not like lemmings. When they go over the edge, they do it together.